and I were chatting earlier, it is nerve-wracking, especially when you don't do it so often. I'm sure Greg has it nailed. Um, but once you get started, it's great. Yeah. And um, Greg asked me, he's so good, because he asked me back in May already if I would speak. Uh, so I've had lots of time to pray and prepare. And as I've watched the messages unfolding over the last number of weeks, I've just seen how the Holy Spirit has just knitted it all together. It's almost like we've been preaching a series, um, although none of us preachers got together, we didn't decide on a theme. Um, but I'll show you as I go through my message just now um, how we will be linking it together. But I want to start off by asking you to think about a time in your life where things didn't go as planned. We maybe you'd suffered a, a big loss. We heard Greg mentioned about some people passing away and very, very sad. Maybe you've had a loss like that. Uh, ju just such a, a heavy situation that you just felt gutted. Um, things became uncertain in your life and maybe you were fearful, fearful about the present, fearful about the future, uh, unsure. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Pierre. And sometimes maybe even unsure of your faith, unsure of Jesus. And if you have been through a time like that, then you could identify with the disciples after Jesus' death. We read accounts in Mark where they were getting together inside with the doors locked. Uh, they were in fear of the Jews, and they were mourning, and they were weeping. You can imagine, their whole world had fallen apart just in a short, in a day. Everything had changed. They'd believed in Jesus. They'd given up their, their families. They'd given up their, their jobs, their careers to follow Jesus, and now suddenly he was dead. And yes, Jesus had explained to them that he was going to die and he was going to rise again, but they didn't get it. They were weeping and they were mourning. They were scared. They were fearful. And even when people came to tell them that Jesus had risen again, Mary Magdalene was the first one. She came to them while they're weeping and mourning. And she said, I've seen Jesus. He's risen. He's alive. And they wouldn't believe it. You can read about that in Mark 16. And then there were two people walking on a country road and Jesus appeared to them. And they went back and they told the disciples and they wouldn't believe it. And then Jesus came himself and appeared to the 11. And he rebuked them for their unbelief and for their hardness of heart. Because they wouldn't believe the accounts of those who told them that he was alive and he'd risen. And was this fearful, weeping, mourning, unbelieving, hard-hearted group, were they ready for the great commission, go into all the world? No, not yet. And that's why Jesus told them to wait for the promise of the Father. And we read about this in Acts 1, verse 4 and 5. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. He didn't suggest it. He didn't say maybe. He ordered them, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Why do you think he mentioned John's baptism? Because he wanted them to know there were two baptisms, baptism in water and baptism with the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you look at the Greek, it actually is in the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so he told them to wait for this promise. He would said to them, you heard it from me. So when had he told them about it? Well, we can read about that in... John chapter 14, where he said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Do you see how that flows? Flowing from loving Jesus and keeping his commandments, he would ask the Father to send another helper, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. You see, you can only receive the helper or the Holy Spirit if you love Jesus and you're in relationship with him. The world can't receive the Holy Spirit because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Well, wow, actually, Jesus says a lot of things in these couple of verses. And so I've, I've just highlighted them. He talks about the helper, and, and the Greek translated as comforter, will be with you forever. Isn't that a comforting thought? The spirit of truth, the world can't receive. It doesn't see him and it doesn't know him. 
And if you think about how deceived the world is, and sometimes I look at things that the people in the world believe and things that they do, and I, I can't understand. I think, can't they see? But they can't see because they don't have the spirit of truth. He will be in you. And this is where I just want to show you how these messages tied up. On Wednesday night, I, I watched Greg's message on Pentecost, um, and he talks about the Holy Spirit being in you. Um, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you fatherless. I will come to you. And Matt preached about two weeks ago about the spirit of sonship. The Father will send the Holy Spirit in my name, Jesus says. He will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And then when he meets with them in Acts, uh, he tells them, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you know, Sydney shared that last week when he talked about the power to share the gospel. So you can see how the Holy Spirit's been just um, putting all these messages together, and I think it's beautiful and it's wonderful. So let's look at how it actually played out on the day of Pentecost and how the promise of the Father actually came to the disciples. So when the day of Pentecost arrived... Now, Greek did, um, Greek, Greg did share this. The Pentecost is a feast. It's one of the Jewish feasts. In fact, the word Pentecost means 50 in Greek because um, the Jews would count 50 days from the Passover, which was when Jesus was crucified. 50 days later, they would have this feast of Pentecost. It's also known as the Feast of Weeks because it would be one day after seven weeks they would have this feast to celebrate the harvest. So when this day came, they were all together, and that... That's what the Jews do, even today. They get together for these feasts. So they were all together in one place. We read in Acts 1, there was probably about 120 of them. Ladies, the Bible tells us they were, the women were there. You know, the women who'd followed Jesus and ministered to him, they were there. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. Um, and the brothers of Jesus. And now, if they were in chapter 1, if they were there, I reckon they were there in chapter 2 as well. Yeah. Um, so 120 of them, roughly, are all together in one place. And suddenly... There came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Can you just imagine that? Imagine if you were there, what, what suddenly you're, you're hearing the sound and there's this mighty rushing wind. And filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So do you think Mary, the mother of Jesus, might have spoken in tongues? I reckon so. She was there. And it must have been so loud because people start to gather outside. They heard these noises and they heard speaking. And in fact, after a little while, thousands had gotten together outside listening to them. And remember, everyone was there for the feast. It, it's a normal thing that people would be in Jerusalem for these feasts. And so there were Jews from every nation under heaven there in Jerusalem. And they were amazed and astonished because each one was hearing them speak in his own language and telling about the mighty works of God. And others were mocking and they said, oh, they're filled with new wine. In fact, they were right. They were filled with new wine, but it was spiritual wine, not natural wine. It was the new wine, the promise of the Father that had come. And Peter, who remembered just 50 days before had denied Jesus three times. He stands up and he starts to speak to the crowd and he gives them the gospel. He even tells them, you crucified Jesus. <laughs> wow, what a turnaround from 50 days before to now being able to stand up boldly and speak in front of thousands of people. And while he's speaking, Peter says, this Jesus God raised up and of that, we all are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. You're seeing and hearing the promise of the Father coming true today, right before your eyes. And, and, and I can just imagine when God, at the foundation of the world, when he planned that Jesus would come and die, I'm sh sure that this was part of his plan, that he would have this promised Holy Spirit that he would send to the believers. So what a difference we're seeing now in someone like Peter, denying and then bold. And what about the other disciples? Uh, what kind of transformations are we seeing with them? 
And I love befores and afters. You know, you can see a before and after makeover. I love those. I love watching these before and afters where they renovate houses, uh, where they take an old house that needs TLC and they gut it, um, and the experts come and they, uh, they redo it completely. New paint, new uh, cupboards, new kitchens, um, and then the landscapers come and they do the gardens, and when you see the before and after, you're just like, wow. You can't even recognize the place. Yeah. But how much more? the before and after of a human being, yeah. of a person. Yeah. And that brought to mind um, a poem by Myra Brooks Welsh. I'd learned it about 20 years ago, and I was just amazed that I, I actually remembered it, so I'm going to share it with you. It's called The Touch of the Master's Hand. It was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folk, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, and then two, only two, two dollars, and who'll make it three? But no, from the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow, then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased. And the auctioneer, in a voice that was quiet and low, said, now, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars, and who'll make it two? Two thousand, and who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, cried he. The people cheered, but some of them cried. We do not understand what changed its worth. Quick came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with his life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Yeah. And so we sing now the change through the, the Holy Spirit. And I just wanted to take some examples. Peter gives us another example. And, and us preachers love Peter. He gives us lots of examples <laughs> that we can preach about. Um, and here's the before on Peter. We know the story where before Jesus was crucified, he was telling the disciples, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. So here we have Peter before the Holy Spirit um, wanting to stand in the way of God's plan, God's eternal almighty plan, just not getting it. But here after the Holy Spirit comes, there's a beautiful story in Acts where Peter is invited to go to some Gentiles, a man called Cornelius. He was actually in the Italian military. And it's an, a fascinating story. There's angels and visions, and you can go read about it in, in Acts, I think it's Acts 11. And so Peter goes across to these Gentiles. Now, for them as Jews, it, it wasn't a done thing. So he shouldn't even have been there, eating with them and staying with them. Uh, but they're all there together, and he starts to share the gospel with them. And the Holy Spirit comes, the promise of the Father comes upon the Gentiles. He hasn't even told them about it yet. And they start speaking in tongues and they, they baptize in the Spirit. And so afterwards, he's telling the other Jews, his fellow Jews, the other disciples about it. And he says, Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Remember when I showed you the teaching of Jesus, Jesus said, I will bring, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance the things that I've taught you. And so here Peter now with the Holy Spirit, um, he's remembering what Jesus had said. And then he goes on to say, if then God gave the same gift to them, to the Gentiles, as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? What a change. Standing in God's way, and now he's saying, who was I to stand in God's way? I just let the Holy Spirit do his thing. Another transformation is Philip. We don't hear a lot about Philip in the Bible, but he's one of the disciples. And one day when Jesus was talking to them, uh, Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, 
Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Like, Philip, 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 don't you get it? I've been with you so long, I've been telling you, you still didn't get it. But then we read about Philip in Acts 8. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. It was not like he had no uh, confusion. He knew exactly who the Christ was, um, having been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And remember also when Jesus taught them, he said, the Holy Spirit is the teacher. He will teach you all things. He had filled in all the gaps, and Philip knew exactly who the Christ was. And it goes on to talk about miracles and things done. And you can go read more about that in Acts. But I think one of the greatest transformations in the New Testament there is the man called Saul, who later on became Paul the Apostle. And we know that Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And he was on the way to Damascus, and I'm sure you know the story. Um, He had letters, and he was going to go and arrest more of the believers there and have them put into prison. But this bright light shines, um, and he, he falls over, and he's blinded, and Jesus speaks to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he's taken to this house in Damascus in a street called Straight. And he waits there for three days. He doesn't eat and he doesn't drink. Um, And then the Holy Spirit appears in a vision to a man called Ananias, one of the believers. And he wants him to go and pray for Saul. But you can imagine Ananias is not too keen, (laughs) given Saul's reputation. But he's obedient to the Holy Spirit and he goes there and he prays for him. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And scales did not only fall from his physical, natural eyes, they fell from his spirit, his spiritual eyes, because suddenly he could see. He was a Pharisee. He knew the scriptures. He knew the Torah. He knew it all. But his eyes had been blinded, and he hadn't seen the truth. And remember, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will be the spirit of truth. And so here we see the spirit of truth revealing truth. Because we read about straight afterwards, for some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? Wow, what a transformation. And we see after the promise of the Father came, um, it was the beginning of the early church. And I'm so inspired by the early church. When you read the book of Acts, and if you're not sure where to read, go and read Acts. It's, it's such an exciting book. So many things are happening. You read about healing the sick, raising the dead, then being transported from one place to another, suddenly arriving in a different place, casting out demons, seeing visions, seeing angels, freed from prison, which is also a reminder that they were being arrested and put in prison and stoned. And there's a story about Peter and John being arrested, and when they, they threatened and told Don't you dare speak about Jesus anymore. They say, is it better for us to listen to God or to man? Wow. What boldness had come upon them after the Holy Spirit. And then they went back and told uh, the other believers about it. And they prayed for them. And I would imagine if it was us, we would have prayed and said, please, Lord, protect them. Protect them from being arrested. Protect them from going to prison. Do you think they prayed that? No. They prayed, Lord, help them to speak with more boldness. What a difference. I wonder what would have happened if they were put into lockdown. (laughs) (laughs) Acts 9.31, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church multiplied. And I love that because it says they were walking in the fear of the Lord, not the Jews. They kind of lost that fear along the way. Now they had reverence and respect for God, and they were walking in his fear and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And that's how the church multiplied. And there's so many examples as you go through the book of Acts where they were living and moving and walking in in the Holy Spirit activity. Um, You can just read things like the Holy Spirit set apart certain men for, for work that he called them to do. They were being sent out by the Holy Spirit. 
Um, they'd written instructions to the Gentiles, and in the instruction they, they wrote, for it had seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So they consulted the Holy Spirit on, on what to say. And at a certain time, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach in a certain area. And Paul testifies that as he went from city to city, the Holy Spirit was telling him about the future that awaited him. And they would often quote and say, thus says the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was speaking so much and so present in the early church. But the Holy Spirit is just as present today and is just as concerned about the now church as he was about the early church. And, and when I watched Greg's message on Wednesday night, I, I hadn't seen it. I wasn't here on the Pentecost. I was at a ladies' camp, so I had no idea that I'm repeating some of the things that Greg said. But clearly the Holy Spirit is trying to get a message across to us. Um, and, and I just have been more and more conscious in a way of being a Holy Spirit carrier. Now, when I think of a lady who becomes pregnant, and I know I've, I've had two children, you're suddenly a whole lot more aware, aware that you're carrying this and nurturing this beautiful baby, this life. And so you're a bit more conscious about what you eat and what you drink and what you do because you're conscious of this life inside of you. Now, think about it. We have the Holy Spirit of Almighty God inside of us. Um, we, we read there in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Wow. So just to be so much more conscious and aware that we're carrying around the Holy Spirit. And I, I'm trying to be more in tune to the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And often it's that still small voice. And just to listen to what he's saying. And the, the other day I went for some blood tests at the hospital and as I was coming out, there was a car parked right by the door with doors open, so obviously waiting for somebody who's being discharged to collect them. Um, I walked past and I got the strong sense to pray with this lady. But I went to my car and um, I, I'm naturally not a very outgoing person, actually. I'm, I'm fairly introvert, keep to myself. So for me to go up to a stranger and say, I want to pray for you, it's just not me. But I went and sat in my car and this, this feeling just didn't leave me. And I thought, okay, for once just be obedient. So I got out <laughs> and I went to that lady um, and I said, I just get this really strong sense to pray with you. And her response was, oh no, we don't need prayer. <laughs> so I was like, oh. Uh, she said, then she said, we've already prayed and that's why we're waiting. So then I just said, oh, I'm so glad, God bless you, and I left. But you know, I wasn't sorry that I'd done it, because I felt like I'd been obedient to the Holy Spirit. And who knows later on, what, thinking about it, what that woman might have felt, hey, wow, God had me in mind. He yeah, was yeah. prompting someone to, so I'm sure it has some value. Yeah. We must remember that the Holy Spirit is in us, speaking to us all the time, prompting us. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a lovely Hindu family that live next door to us. And the Holy Spirit's been speaking to me about the wife. And she's a beautiful lady. And I just had a vision the one day of her standing in front of the judgment seat without Christ and being judged. And I'm standing nearby in my white robe, you know, in my gold sash. Uh, and, and she's looking across to me saying, why didn't you tell me? And I, I felt awful, and I thought, God, I have to give her the gospel. Can you just imagine how you'd feel on that day? And so, um, I, uh, coupled with that, I felt prompted to meet her for coffee, so I sent her a WhatsApp. Now, she's been living next door, I don't even know how long, 15 years, 20 years, I've no idea. I might have, we might have met up two or three times to discuss things like the trees on the border of our garden, and you know, things like that. Um, I just sent her a WhatsApp saying, I'd love to meet you for coffee. And her response was so positive. She was like, yes, I'd love to meet you for coffee. I'd love to go down to the beach. And so we met up and uh, we took a little walk on the promenade and had coffee and chatted for an hour and a half. And I'm praying for her now. We're going to do it again. She said, we must do this again. Uh, absolutely. She doesn't know I have an ulterior motive. But um, I'm trusting the Lord for her salvation. Um, 
Helen told me a story about um, a lady who lived like a street or two behind where we live, uh, who, and this is going back many years, who, who spread the gospel to the whole street, and just about everybody got born again, including Greg's mom and Greg's family. And what a gift is Greg to the church, through one lady who has just followed the promptings of the Holy Spirit and started to share the gospel. I think it's inspiring. And the second verse that I've got there, I just put there just to make you realize that even though maybe you haven't spoken in tongues like uh, they did on the day of Pentecost, but if you're born again, the Spirit of God dwells in you. It says there in the, the second line, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So if you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you do have the Spirit of Christ, which is the Holy Spirit. There is only, yeah. only one. The Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. So you do have the Holy Spirit. So he's living inside of you. Let him be prompting you. If you think about the early church, um, we read in Corinthians how they would get together, and often it was in homes, in houses. And one would come with a hymn, another would come with a lesson, someone else with a revelation, somebody with, a few of them with tongues, um, and then they'd have an interpretation. They, they were so Holy Spirit-led and Holy Spirit-living so much so that Paul had to put some restrictions, and he had to say, you know, when you meet, uh, if you have a tongue, like, limited to two or three at the most, because they were obviously getting carried away, or let the prophets speak, just two or three of them. And I love this concept of the church in the house. You know, it's our, our home groups, our community groups, um, where we get together in the homes, because that's a wonderful opportunity to be sharing um, in, in our gifts and bringing something to it. And in our home group, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit because I have an earnest desire to have Holy Spirit activity going on in our home group. And I know that the Holy Spirit has an earnest desire to be active with us too. If you think about the messages, Greg preached about Pentecost. He then preached about people of the Spirit. Matt preached about the Spirit of Sonship. And Sydney talked about the power to be witnesses. I mean, these themes keep coming through to us. The Holy Spirit wants to be active with us. And I'm just looking at the time. So the last thing that, that I'll share with you is I just want to briefly talk about the gifts. Because coming with the promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings gifts. And there are varieties of gifts, and there's varieties of service, but it's all the same Spirit, it's all the same Lord. But the thing I want you to focus on is verse 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. We receive the Spirit, and we receive gifts of the Spirit to share with each other. It's for the common good. It's not just for me to keep for myself, for my little happy party, but it's to share. And all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions each one individually as he wills. So in a congregation or in a home group, he will spread different gifts across so that we all complement each other with what gifts we have. And then in his writing, the Apostle Paul mentions nine gifts, which we'll just briefly go through. The one is a word of wisdom. And I asked the Holy Spirit, I said, please give me an example of the word of wisdom. And the example I got was... Um, in the early church, the apostles was, got so busy trying to help uh, the orphans and the widows and distributing food and for their needs um, that they were being distracted. And it was a word of wisdom for them to appoint certain brothers to do that so that they could focus on prayer and the ministry. So that's an example of a word of wisdom. A word of knowledge is where somebody, and we sometimes have it in the service here, someone gets a word of knowledge about a, a sickness or a condition. We had one not so long ago where somebody had a word of knowledge that there was somebody experiencing terrible nightmares. And you, when you come up here, it's a f step of faith. If the person who comes up here and says, I believe there's someone here having terrible nightmares, it's faith because you don't know for sure. And sometimes people are shy and they won't even admit it. And so you stand and you feel like a, a little bit, mm, okay, maybe I was wrong. But if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, you won't be wrong. Later on, sometimes people come after the service and say, yeah. it was me. Yeah. And then there's a the gift of faith. Now, we all have faith because you can't be a believer without faith. But this is a special gift of faith, to, to have faith for bigger things, maybe faith for finances or faith um, for, for bigger than just believing that you're a Christian. And the gifts of healing, I think we all understand and know that one. The working of miracles. That was like feeding the 5,000. 
Um, when I was on leave, we went and visited Live Village, and Stacy, who used to work there some years ago, took us on a little tour around, and she was telling us how on the opening, um, they had caterers there who catered some food, and when they looked at the food in the caterer's van, and they looked at the number of people, they were like, whoa, this is, doesn't match up. Too many people, too little food. Um, and so her and Titch's wife, I, I forget her name, Joan, um, they prayed. And she said it was miraculous because the caterer just kept bringing more and more food out of the van. Um, so there, there's a working of a miracle. Then there's prophecy, which we, we do understand, typically talking about the future. The ability to distinguish between spirits, a, a gift of discernment. When I was at the ladies' camp, um, we were having a time of worship, which is normally quite noisy, and you know, things are going, people are praying and singing and, and carrying on. Um, and then there was this, this noise coming on, and there was a manifestation of a spirit that was not the Holy Spirit. And that's when you need the gift of discernment, because I didn't know, but another, one of the leaders there picked it up and took that lady out and ministered to her. Um, so you need that gift of discernment. And then there's various kinds of tongues. So let me ask you, how many of you have received and have the gift of tongues, can speak in tongues? Quite a few of us. There should be more. We'll have to arrange a, a, an opportunity. But now I want to do like Sydney did last week, and I want to ask you, how often do you speak in tongues? How often do you pray in tongues? Because again, that's a beautiful gift of the Spirit. It's the promise of the Father that he gave us. In his, in his wonderful, awesome plan, he gave us this gift of speaking in tongues. And I was watching a little... Um, video with Andrew Warmack the other night, and he was saying when he speaks in tongues, when he's praying on his own, he asks the Holy Spirit to give him the interpretation. So he doesn't speak in tongues, stop, and then pray in English. While he's praying in tongues, he asks for the interpretation. Now, I've done that a few times over the years, and it's amazing what download you get from the Holy Spirit. We have access to these wonderful gifts, and we're just not using them enough. We, we've, we've become a little bit... Um, stuck in our ways. You know, we, we're so distracted with other things. And the Holy Spirit is alive and well and working in the church. And so I want to encourage you, like Paul said to Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God. Yeah. You know, it's like when you're making a bra fire and there's just those little, um, it's not even flames. It's almost like the coals are just, it's just slightly warm and you have to blow and wave and um, ignite that fire. Ignited again, so that when we receive the Holy Spirit, that the, the, this is the picture that I got, that it's coming into us, onto us, we baptized in and with the Holy Spirit, but it's to share. Yeah. It's for the common good of everybody. So let's be bold, let's be brave. Think about the apostles, what they went through and how the Holy Spirit changed them. And let's believe for a Holy Spirit change and transformation in our own lives. Let's stand, and I'd love to pray with you. Mm -hmm.